Thank you very much, uh, Maya, for the invitation. Uh, as she already said, we met on in kind of the rural north of the Netherlands on a uh, on a, uh, a summer school for PhDs uh, uh, 13 years ago, and it's so nice to uh, to see uh, all the great things you've done and, uh, and what you've become. Uh, I want to thank the European Forum here at the at the Hebrew University uh, for their support. Can you assist them? Yes, of course. Uh, would that be okay? Yes. Uh, the Israeli Association for the Study of European Integration and the Friedrich uh, Ebert Stiftung. Um, and I would like to talk to you today about a book that I have to send the final version in two weeks to the publisher. And uh, there's nothing uh, that I need to revise, but on the basis of the questions and the comments I'll hear, have here today, there might be things that I want to revise. So in that way, you, uh, you have a real impact on, uh, on the outcome of this, uh, of this book. It's forthcoming with Oxford University Press in a, in a time where many academics uh, write only articles. I'm an example of that. Uh, I've done that for, for a long time. Uh, I was asked to write a book and I, 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 I did it and I returned to a topic that I hadn't studied so much, I moved more generally into elections and party politics, but uh, returned to the original topic of my PhD was, which was about public support towards the EU and how that affects uh, behavior in elections uh, more generally. So, and uh, this is what the book has become, so hopefully uh, I'm going to uh, uh, say something interesting to you. Uh, I think uh, uh, the, the, the kind of introduction by, uh, by Mickey Drill about uh, what's happening in Europe and, and by, I don't know which of the, of the, of the two, uh, oh. it, both, both of them, but the two interns, I think uh, we share much of the same ideas about what's happening in Europe. Uh, a European crisis, right? Even though uh, we see a lot of discussion about Macron winning the election, uh, the Mark Rutte ultimately still remaining the largest party in, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, we shouldn't forget that, for example, Marine Le Pen doubled the vote share of her father. Uh, she's mainstreamed uh, uh, the Front National in France. Uh, and also, uh, the, this was the highest level of invalid ballots and, uh, and turnout since, since the, the, the kind of 69 election. Uh, which is kind of the 68 movement. So, so there's a lot of discontent in these party systems. Um, the refugee crisis and the Eurozone crisis and, uh, uh, are, are, are two kind of the backdrops of, uh, of, uh, of this discontent. And, and I think that the real issue of, of what your skepticism can do is was seen by the, I mean, that's the image of, uh, of Nigel Farage, the, the, the head of, or the former head, I have to say, of the UK Independence Party, uh, who had been able to, with, with help of the Conservative Party, to pull off uh, his dream, which was uh, to leave the EU and uh, just make it, we have to remember, it was a short, uh, kind of close vote, uh, but, uh, but, but win the so-called Brexit referendum. The idea that Europe is in crisis had not gone unnoticed even in the EU. Usually EU officials are not necessarily known for their critical remarks on the EU, but uh, both uh, Jean-Claude Juncker and Donald Tusk, those are the two uh, um, uh, quotes I'm going to take, perhaps also because they were uh, prime ministers and presidents within their own, within some of the member states, have uh, have put it to uh, uh, kind of quite uh, clearly. Let us be on let us be very honest in our diagnosis. Our European Union is at least in part in an existential crisis. Not sure how you can be partly in that crisis, but uh, uh, at least uh, he uh, uh, that was what he said in the State of Union uh, in 2016. In the similar year, uh, Donald Tusk. Obsessed with the idea of instant and total integration, we have failed to notice that ordinary people, the citizens of Europe, do not share our Euro enthusiasm. Disillusioned with the great visions of the future, they demand that we cope with the present reality better than we've been doing until now. Together with uh, the Battlesman Foundation, or on behalf of the Battlesman Foundation, we conduct biannual uh, public opinion surveys uh, where we get a sense of what, what Europeans want from Europe and, and the stark contrast is that people adhere to the idea of membership, except the British, uh, adhere to the, to the idea of membership but are very disillusioned with the policies coming out of the EU. And that's not just a phenomenon in the south of Europe, that's a phenomenon that you see in, 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 many, in many countries. So there is something going on and there's some change and Maya reflected to it already by kind of coming with anecdotal evidence of her students' uh, numbers in terms of your skeptics. So there's been a lot of work to try to describe uh, um, uh, what are explanations of public support. And, and for a very long time, academics were not really interested in public support for the EU. It was described as a so-called permissive consensus, i.e. what happened in Europe was more or less in line with what was good for your country. And actually, Europe was not part and partial of a debate at the, at the domestic level. I think, actually, it has not been part and partial of the debate since maybe 2005, where the, where the referenda 
uh, constitutional treaty referenda were not voted down in your usual suspects, Denmark and Ireland, but were voted down in core member states, the Netherlands and France. And from that onwards, and it, and it coincides with also the electoral success of, for example, Gert Wilders, a very prominent anti-Islam, anti-EU uh, politician, political entrepreneur in the Netherlands, this idea of we may be moving away from a permissive consensus to a constraining consensus where public opinion is very divided or, or is increasingly you're skeptic. That's what, what, what the media also tells us. I'm going to nuance that, a bit, that, that, that image a little bit. But that public opinion has become important. It has become important because why did we pay so much attention to the Dutch election? I've been on, for the first time in my life, on BBC Newsnight, on Christian Amanpour. I never had those things before. Why were people interested in, a very, you know, in, a, in an election in a very small country? Because if Gerd Wilders would enter the government coalition, that would have straight on knock-on effects to what will happen in the European Council. I don't have to tell it to someone who is a, a member of, uh, I think you're a member of CDC, right? or who's close to, yeah, member of CDSA, what the way the EU deals with, with parties that are perhaps soft to skeptic or hard to skeptic, and the same was of course also for the interest in the pen. I think the real test case will be, and we can talk about in the, in the Q&A, the Italian election with uh, Beppe Grillo's Five Star Movement and the Lega Nord, who are very, very vocal anti-EU parties, and, and especially Beppe Grillo looks, looks, looks extremely, extremely well in the polls. So this is a very different picture of this permissive consensus, more or less a kind of nodding along public opinion that was not very critical to a much more kind of critical uh, uh, phase uh, of public opinion. So the two dominant perspectives on this have been interests, and that was actually, it's very, it's very interesting, my book will also come out, it's like you get a book on public opinion every decade, right? So that seems to, something seems to be changing every decade. I, uh, that's a, that's a, of a very good friend and, uh, and scholar, Matthew Gabel, who is an American. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, I think also my, my own thinking about the EU is sharpened being in the UK. Sometimes you need a EU, an American scholar to write about the EU because they have a bit of a distance perspective. And Matt Gabel's argument was quite simple. Uh, it was kind of an interest explanation that people with high incomes, high skilled workers who are able to utilize the single market at that time, the period where he was writing about, this book came out in 1998, was the time that the single market had, uh, was, was established. Um, 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 that those are the, are, are the ones that benefit from the common market and they are more supportive. The same at the national level that countries that do well economically will be supportive of the EU because they're able to, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, utilize uh, that common market. In the 2000s, that's uh, Lauren McLaren, who's a professor in, uh, in, in Glasgow, uh, developed the idea, well, maybe it's not just about market integration. She's also writing, ten, almost 10 years later, that the EU at that moment in time had also met, you know, developed in a more political union, and a union that, inf that, according to your skeptics, infringes on sovereignty at the national level and does way more than just economics. And also, especially what she highlights is free movement of people, which led to intra-EU migration, which of course, you know, through the refugee crisis has gotten much more salient. This has been also developed further by Lisbeth Hoog and Gary Marx and others, uh, Teresa Kuhn on transactionalism, but the idea is that, well, European integration opens up your country to foreign influence, and that can be either politically or that can be because there's foreigners or, you know, people who don't you necessarily see uh, as part of your, of your demos or as part of your, of, of, of your your kind of shared identity, come into the country and people who feel uneasy with this, and it's often those that feel exclusively national or strongly national, that they are then less supportive. And these two explanations have been dominant in also the explanations on the, on, on, on the Brexit outcome, right? That there was the losers of globalization, i.e. those that, that could not benefit from the single market, that turns against the EU, and people who had issues with immigration and national control. However, in the recent rise of your skepticism, we see it really only in the data in the last seven years or so. Um, and it could be that people before didn't care enough about the EU to really honestly uh, uh, report in a survey, but nonetheless, let's, this is the service we have. We see a, a rise of Euroscepticism and it creates some puzzles for both of these explanations. I'm not saying that there's not a correlation. I, I, I truly think that these two perspectives are very important, but maybe something else is going on as well. This is, for example, on um, the EU opinion survey that, that I do together with the Bertelsmann Foundation. Um, and what we ask is the kind of hypothetical Brexit question. If there was a referendum held today in your country, what would you vote? 
we look at the EU28 and we also look at the six largest member states. I just put four because there's too many lines if we get the 28 on it. So I do the six largest member states. And interestingly, what we see is we see not necessarily that the losers of the Eurozone crisis are those that, are, that show the weakest support for membership. Spain is a country that has arguably, uh, not as much as Greece, arguably, but, but has, uh, has been affected very strongly, is very pro-membership, uh, uh, pro that's that, uh, that grey line. The same uh, with Poland that's doing relatively well, Germany that's doing relatively well, but Italy is actually the, the, the country I'm most worried about. It's pretty much 50-50 uh, if you ask a membership referendum now. Uh, Pepe Grillo has said that he wants to have a membership referendum. Constitution, that's not allowed in Italy, but he might find a way around it if he gets, uh, if, if he gets elected. That, that country fits in a different category. So, so what's going on? It doesn't necessarily fit that interest explanation that if you are affected by the crisis negatively, you become, you become uh, negative. So the same is that, well, if your skepticism was linked to economic grievance solely, what we should see is that if we, we know that, that people who vote for hard or skeptic parties might do that for several reasons, but do that also for the anti-EU stance of these parties, and hard or skepticism is usually uh, defined by Taggart and uh, Sbrzyak, I can't pronounce his name properly, but anyway, uh, he's Polish, um, uh, uh, as parties who reject the entire idea of Europe, right? Those are exit parties, if you will. Soft or skeptic parties are parties that want to reform. The, the kind of clearest examples of that recently were Syriza and Podemos, who were not necessarily anti the European idea, but anti the execution of, of the European idea. So if we take these hard Euroskeptic parties as an indicator of the level of Euroskepticism, we see something weird going on, where a long time it was the idea that if the countries are not doing well economically, you saw the large share of Euroskepticism. You see the reverse, right? <laughs> so you see actually a lot of hard Euroskeptic parties in countries that have arguably really done well in the Eurozone crisis and have done well from the Euro, right? The Dutch. Uh, economy or the, the, the German economy in terms of exports has benefited from the euro because they have a currency that is undervalued given their, uh, their financial position, whereas in the south that's, that's, that's the opposite story. So the country that you actually don't find here, for example, is Spain. It doesn't even have a hard euro skeptic policy, right? So in that way, it just also again brings up a puzzle for these existing theories. Then going more within countries, not just looking at aggregates, but looking more within countries, this is just a, a two, I'm, this is what I tell my students not to do, to cherry pick two examples, but I can tell you that these are representative of, uh, of, of larger elements. So the dominant idea, and that's also been, 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 been written in the, in the Financial Times, in the Atlantic by Matthew Goodwin, a, a good colleague of mine, is that this was the left behind vote, right? It was about those manufacturer workers, unemployed workers that voted against the EU. So the first, uh, a result to come in was Sunderland. Sunderland is, is, uh, was very fast in, 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 in uh, counting the ballots, but also the margin of, uh, so it was 61 leave, that mar they were predicted to go out in the polls, but the margin was 10%, right? And this is over 20%. So at that time, I was with people at the foreign office, they got very worried. Like, okay, this is, so we're, we, we've been underestimating leave in the polls, right? So this is, a, this is your average, average kind of example of, 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 a, of an economic grievance environment. If we take the unemployment rate and the average house price as an indication of wealth and economic grievance, this is an 8% unemployment rate where it's almost full employment in the UK right now. And also the average house price is relatively low. On the other side is Bournemouth. Bournemouth is uh, known for two things, pensioners and for its extremely high-tech industry. So it's called Silicon Beach. It has the highest growing high-tech firms in the UK. It is a, a country that, all, it is a, a, a constituency that also voted out by, the, by half of that margin, but nonetheless voted out. And it has 1.2% uh, unemployment and it had a double average house price. So this is not a poor environment. The same will go for that entire south of the UK, Dorset, Somerset, extremely wealthy areas, the south of Essex, which is also quite wealthy, a lot of commuters into London, they voted out Swindon. So not your usual like left behind uh, cases. And the last thing is, well then, a lot of people say, well maybe this was all about immigration and about this identity concerns, right? And uh, Lisbeth Hoog and Gary Marx have developed this idea that those people who feel exclusively national that those are more likely to kind of be your skeptic. Could that be an alternative explanation? So here I'm going to take a, a data from the Netherlands. 
And I have two time series here. This is the vote share of extreme right parties, which are the Eurosceptic parties in the Netherlands. Actually, I can make this look bigger because the Socialist Party in the Netherlands is also quite Eurosceptic. So this is an underestimation of Eurosceptic's uh, vote share in the Netherlands. And this is the share of people who feel exclusively national based on the Eurobarometer. So the, the argument is that people who are exclusively national are mobilized by these extreme parties against the EU. Well, actually, the share of exclusive people feel exclusively national and the people who identify with Europe has increased in the Netherlands. But nonetheless, the Netherlands has been seen of some of the fastest increases in Euroscepticism in recent years. So it's not necessarily that, I'm not disputing that there's not correlations between national identity and not feeling national and, 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 and being anti-EU or with economic grievances, but it's not the entire story. So that's what, uh, that's why I admit. So one of these things have already been kind of outlined in, in, in a recent review paper in the Annual Review of Political Science with uh, Sarah Holbolt. What are the kind of the assumptions or the observations that I make? Well, one, that the crisis, so both the refugee crisis and the, and the Eurozone crisis, have uncovered structural imbalances in the Union, which have made the experiences in the EU fundamentally different. I am married to a Spanish economist. This was our breakfast discussion. <laughs> I'm Dutch. Uh, people have a much larger stock of EU knowledge, but knowing it doesn't mean that you love it. Right? Then the EU isn't popular, but national politics isn't popular either. So we have to look at this not just from the EU side, but also from the national politics side. And what is interesting, and that's what we saw in the kind of, you know, Bournemouth and, and Sunderland example, and I'm, I'm working on this more and more generally, it's not just the objective conditions. It's people's subjective perceptions of those conditions. And populist right parties and populist left parties sometimes, as well as, as mainstream parties, distort these views about what's actually going on in the country. And there's a lot of fear, and, we, and with Batsman we've, we've developed a, a kind of a, 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 a analysis on, on that. I'm not going to go into that. I, I, I can in the, in the Q&A. So what I'm trying to do in the book is say, well, that actually, that what I say in the introduction, your skepticism or support for the EU, either side of that coin, is like a kaleidoscope that reflects the national conditions within the EU that people find themselves in. It mirrors very strongly what you are, what you, what you, what you are experienced to it at home, and there's no such thing necessarily as a European experience per se. Perhaps from an Indian perspective there is, but from an EU perspective, not necessarily. I'm, Indian, I just mean, or American, I just mean, you know, like in, from, from, from another continent. So the focus has been so much on the determinants, trying to understand what explains it, and that we don't really know what Euroscepticism actually is. The taggart sibirsiak work that I talked about is only on political parties. It's not on, on, on public opinion. So existing approaches have this very weird idea, I think, that support for the EU is unidimensional, and you can measure it by asking people, do you support membership? Which we show that actually very different answers give very different questions. And also that it's a fixed kind of evaluation about the EU per se. What if it's relative to what you find at home, right? So the Brexit campaign was a lot about we can go it alone. Whereas many, many people would suggest in the, in the Spanish or in the Greek case, people feel that, well, even though the EU is not good to them, going it alone is worse than, than staying in the EU. So I suggest that public opinion towards the EU is relational, ultimately relational to the, to the conditions you find at home, and not just the objective, but also the subjective perceptions of those conditions. And it's multinational. And so what people are actually doing, they're benchmarking against the EU, and, and they might even, I don't look at that, I open up the possibility in my book, they might even be benchmarking across borders, I, I only look, look within countries, but this is, a, this is, a, this is important uh, to think about. So what this, so this is the only kind of academic part that I'm going to do, um, just because I want to make clear what the concept is of, of this kind of benchmark theory. So the ultimate insight or intuition is that support and skepticism towards the EU are a comparison. And what are they a comparison? Just for now, assume that, that, that support and opposition is unidimensional. I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna uh, uh, lift that assumption in a second. You have the status quo of membership there, and you have the alternative state. It's the counterfactual. How would my country do outside of the EU? And in this case, you have, if it goes from negative to positive, you have a status quo which is perceived as more negative than the alternative state, i.e. my country being outside. So these people feel, and this is what I call an EU differential, they're in a, they're in a differential of loss. 
every British, the majority of British people in the surveys are in this, are in this case. When you experience loss, you might be willing to take a risk to change. You're not as, as ad adherent to, uh, to the status quo. So if the alternative state of one's country being outside the EU is preferred more than the current, than the, than the status quo, people are your skeptic, right? So they think that their country outside is more preferable than being inside. The opposite would be true for those people who are in what I call that a game frame, where the status quo of EU membership is considered as more positive than the alternative state and their country being outside, right? And what you use here is that if the alternative state of being outside is, uh, is less preferred than the current status quo, people are supported, uh, uh, people are defined as, as, as supporters. Interestingly, that what you do know is that what we know from behavioral economics, so these are just insights from behavioral economics, this is prospect theory for, um, from behavioral economics, that people, if the outcome is uncertain, the alternative state is uncertain, that they prefer the status quo, so if, they, if, this, if the lines will be at the same point, they will prefer the status quo over the alternative state. So the equal sign is in support, right? So this should give a buffer for the EU, at least, that you know, people are more status quo biased, more status quo orientated. So, and then, if we understand in this way, so it's relational on how people think their own country is doing, right? That which benefits do people consider? I, so I, I looked at this in a kind of like one dimensional way. So I, I'm not saying that people can, there's many fine grained by Clay, Sefrese, and others, very fine grained 16 dimensions or eight dimensions of support. I'm not so sure that people know so much about the EU to do that. But what people often distinguish about, and that's what, what, what kind of seminal work by Dahl, a very prominent political scientist, argued that people are able to, do, to, to uh, distinguish between the outcomes they get today and the fairness of the regime in order to ensure that it gives them good outcomes in the future, right? So the, the regime needs to operate properly and the, uh, the policy is the outcome. So that's, that's the two distinction I make. So regime are evaluations on how the constitution in the country, in, in the country or the treaties in the, the acquis uh, in the European level operate in practice and how fair, how, how uh, uh, good are they? And the policies are evaluations of those collective decisions and actions and outcomes taken by, uh, by uh, national or EU actors. So if we put this together, I created this idea of an EU differential, those people who see the benefits of the status quo as higher or lower compared to the alternative state, and uh, we can do that on a policy differential and a regime differential. You, get, you can get a two by two and you can describe very, very different types of, uh, of public opinion. Note that these I call skeptics, you might also call them supporters, depends on if you do the glasses half full or half empty, right? Because these are the mixed types. So these two types is what Taggart and so on would call soft Euroskeptics, I call them ambivalent Euroskeptics. So they like the regime of the EU more than their national regime, uh, but they, uh, but they uh, dislike the policies more or the, or, or the reverse, right? So policy skeptics are those that think that their country would do better in terms of policy than the EU. Regime skeptics are those that think that their country would do better in terms of regime than to policy. This is very dominant in the German debate, which is kind of the democratic deficit debate, right? So that the policies might actually be okay coming out of Europe, but the way they're derived, they're, that's not fair or that's not necessarily democratic. Exit, exit skeptics are those that hold differentials positive towards the, or negative towards the EU and positive towards the alternative state in both dimensions. And what I will go on to show is that those are the ones that vote for heartier skeptic parties, who are more likely to vote, for, uh, to vote leave. Those are the ones you need to worry about now. And then the EU should worry about these two types moving in to the exit skeptics, right? Loyal support here, and that's very important, these are people who perceive the EU as, as, as the status quo as better than an alternative state, but it doesn't mean that people necessarily love the EU, right? This is quite the idea, well, okay, the EU might not necessarily be perfect, but it's better than what I have at home, right? So it doesn't mean that you're super supportive either, right? It can, it has, it has both these groups in it. The same goes for the regime and policy skeptics. They're skeptical, but it doesn't mean that they're extremely skeptical. So you're, you're, you're really arch your skeptics are in this exit category. Um, so if you do these types, and I'm just giving you some, I'm just giving you some data, so here you find these, these, these different quadrants and you find the parties on average. It doesn't mean that there's a lot of variation within the countries, right? But here are your countries on, uh, on, on average in 2014. I'm just going to go uh, for the sake of time, sorry, and more, a, a bit quicker. 
So what's interesting, what you find is that re this really reflects the conditions that people find at home. And I'm going to look at two conditions. So this is people who live in bad economic conditions and good economic conditions, and that's just basically, do you have economic growth or unemployment above or below the EU average, right? And what you see is that in good economic conditions, you see a much larger share of exit skeptics than you see in bad economic conditions. So this is this idea that it's not about the interest necessarily, if it's about relative of what you have at home. So yes, you can, people can only afford to be exit skeptics when they think that their country will do well outside. And for loyal, it's the reverse relationship. And the same goes for quality of government. So this is based on corruption, for example, right? That's another area that I study. In high quality of government environments, you see much more exit Eurosceptics than in low quality of government environments. So what's interesting is that if you take these two together, I call them, do you have a viable exit option or not? So in terms of economics and in terms of quality in government, you know, uh, are you above the EU average or below the EU average? And what you see over time, this has changed between before the crisis, 2008, and after the crisis, that what happened in the countries that have a viable exit option, not so much happened in the no viable exit option. But in what happened in the, in the, in the countries with the, the, the viable exit option, who perform economically well and have high quality of government, a steady, a big increase in exit skepticism and, uh, uh, and a uh, big decrease in, uh, in loyal support. And what you see, even if you compare this in terms of these quadrants, you see almost two worlds developing. This is 2008. You see actually the black ones are the countries that are performing above the EU average. The gray ones are below the EU average. They were kind of still flocked together, right? And by 2014, that's no longer the case. So you see the, 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 the highly performing environments are, are on this, either your regime skeptic or exit skeptics, where uh, the, 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 the lesser, relatively lesser performing environments are on the either policy skepticism, but primor, primarily loyal support. So this also puts in question a little bit this kind of two speeds Europe, because you might be creating already, or you might be adding on to the two different worlds that are already out there. So why is this important, right? And then I'll, I'll, I'll close off and, 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 uh, and hopefully that uh, in, in, in enough time. So these different types, which are now very differently distributed in the, on average in the union, give rise to very different policy priorities. I'm just gonna tell you, you wouldn't be surprised. Exit skeptics care primarily about immigration, right? Uh, regime skeptics care primarily about quality of government. Policy skeptics care primarily about growth and, and, the, and the economy. But they also give very different reform preference. What do exit skeptics want? They want to go out or they want total renationalization of the EU, right? So they want an intergovernmental organization. Uh, so this is important for the EU because one size fits all is not going to work on this, right? And this, I'm not even talking about, and the entire book shows also how much variation there is within countries, right? Then this matters because they have very different behavioral consequences. And this is why, um, some of these types are much more important for the survival of the EU than others, right? So what's really important is that this share of exit skeptics, I can tell you about between, in, in the countries, they, they vary between 20 uh, and 35% in certain countries. Interestingly, there's exit skeptics in Greece, there's exit skeptics in, in, in Spain, there's a, so it's not just a phenomenon, it's, it's primarily in, uh, in, in the north, but nonetheless. And what's really important is these ambivalent skeptics that could go either way, but right? how are they going to be swayed in the future? So, uh, these are just uh, to show you what they do. So what you see here is that the exit Eurosceptics, they have a 66% to vote Remain. They still vote in Remain, right? That's, but they have a 34% uh, support for the uh, Eurosceptic party, and especially of a hard right variety. So Geert Wilders, Marine Le Pen, uh, those type of characters. So the loyal supporters, 85% remain, so much more starkly remain. And if they support a Eurosceptic party, it's usually of the soft left, but probably for different reasons, what I show, more for their economic stances than for their EU stances. So now I'm gonna round off. So people weigh up their national and European evaluations, and then the, the level of EU support of skepticism varies by and within countries, and it has also changed as the EU has changed and has dealt with the refugee or, or, or the Eurozone crisis in, in particular ways, and I outline that much more in the book. And the increase in EU support might not just be, or, or, or skepticism, might not just be because of the EU, but might also be because of something that happens nationally. I'll give you an example, 1975 when we had the first referendum in, in, in Britain, Britain was the sick man of Europe. In 2016, when, uh, uh, when there was a referendum, the, uh, the UK was doing really well, right? So these contexts nationally matter. 
And should we worry? I think yes. Uh, some of the people in the commission I've talked to uh, uh, don't agree, but uh, I, I think we should worry. Even if exit skeptics are not the majority position, if we define ambivalent skeptics also as skeptics, right? I said we can look at it in both ways, but if we define them as skeptics, the majority of people are skeptical today. And what, and what is important is as the EU is not finding sometimes unif you know, solutions to certain problems that people care about because the union is so diverse, so what works for Greece might not work for, for the Netherlands, or might work for Spain, might not work for Germany, that there could be a serious risk that these people uh, move to the more kind of uh, 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 exit skeptic uh, uh, category. And why is it important? Because exit skepticism is associated with this hard party support, these, these kind of exit parties, and with, uh, with a higher likelihood uh, to want to vote remain. In the book, I also go out, you know, I, I try to come up with like institutional solutions for this. That's probably too much to do uh, here today, but I'm also more than willing to think a little bit about, along those lines with you about. Uh, but uh, but any any comments, suggestions, or, or questions about the book are, are very welcome. Thank you for your attention.